It's interesting. We all are here gathered in this beautiful light-filled space. And I think every one of us to a person can agree that light is the most essential element of the buildings that we are constructing, designing, and creating. And light is a key element, even in biomimicry, as Michael was speaking. And it's because of a number of things that daylighting is really coming to the foreground. It was normally accepted because that was the way that we were able to work longer hours to get light into the spaces that we were occupying for protection. Now it's a way to solve an energy problem. And we're monetizing that on energy efficiency by combining it with modern controls and really well-planned, thought-out commissioning protocols. But you know, energy efficiency is not just the only way to sell daylight, to get a benefit from daylight. And it has to do with a different type of energy efficiency. And that is human energy efficiency. And that's where daylight and the connective link to human metabolic processes, health, and behavioral outcomes really come to bear. Here at this platform are four words, people, scale, politics, economy. The overarching view of this whole entire conference. But you know, the one thing that's missing is right here. Right here in the center, we've had theory. We've had what to do, when to do it. But we haven't said why or how to do anything. We haven't asked this body and brain how to do this. We've been speaking about people. We've been speaking about their aesthetics. We've been speaking about buildings. But we haven't spoken to the real nature of why daylighting works. And as Martine had said, the science of health and light is changing daily. As a matter of fact, I was late in delivering my program here until earlier this morning because of some new research that just came out yesterday. And so the field is evolving. It's changing minute by minute. But this program is about what we know the latest information to be. And you know the reason why it's going to have weight? Why people are going to pay attention to health and light in the years ahead, generations ahead? Because of this, because of money. As our first speaker today, Peter Head, said, you know, we have to figure a way to monetize daylighting. Well, here it is. Heads up, it's because of money. Right now, the gross domestic product worldwide is $61.9 tri trillion. Worldwide GP GDP healthcare spending is going up out the roof. 17, almost 18% of the US GDP is spent on health care. Now, even those countries that have government subsidized health care still are paying the burden. 12% here in the Netherlands, almost 10% in Japan. And the CDC estimates that by 2080, greater than 50% of all of our economic wealth is going to be spent somehow on delivering health care. And that's the economic bottom line of why health and light make a difference. Because we're starting to see economic viability for health surfaces, health buildings, build environments that are designed for that human being, each and every one of us, what the body and brain need to be able to deliver a healthy, well-functioning, operational DNA, metabolic, immune system, and all of the other systems that comprise health and wellness within our body. And if we can do that, that's when we can make a difference, an economic difference. And the areas of concern, heart disease. In the US, 754,000 people each year are diagnosed with a myocardial infarction. Half of those are returned to the healthcare environment because of a number of different reasons that we are now starting to see if we take some build environmental measures as we discharge those patients, we can make a significant difference. Diabetes, depression, right now the world is starting to see a surge in depression. And the worst depression that we have, the attractable depression, 298 million people, or 5% of the entire um, uh, area in terms of the developed areas and the population have one form or another of the depression. 
And this we now can tie back to the built environment and some behavioral modifications as well as uh, built environment modifications that can make a significant difference. Obesity, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, they are all tied to light and how light is distributed within the build environment and the individual is exposed to that light. And the biggie right here, cancer. A Harvard 210 study, newly diagnosed cancer patients cost the global economy $300 billion a year. It's interesting. We can now take diabetes, Parkinson's, cancer, and a whole host of other comorbidities and lump them and tie them directly back, just as Michael was doing by tracing things and very artistically in his program. We can trace every one of those health concerns back to a circadian system. Now, circadian system, everyone thinks circadian system is health, you know, it's uh, a sleep-wake cycle and a light-dark cycle, circadian rhythm. Uh-uh. Circadian system is more than that. It controls our heartbeat and our blood pressure. And it impacts every single one of these other conditions within the body. The immune system, wound healing regulation, how do you think we are getting the statistics of sending a heart patient home much more quickly by 2.6 days, simply by having he or she recuperate in a hospital room that's on the sunny side of the hospital. And by the way, that equates to anywhere from 12 to $24,000 US just for the bed, not any of the medical procedures or the drugs that are administered. Multiply that by 2.6. The immune system, hormonal regulation, metabolic functioning, all of this is under the governance of the circadian system. And by the way, the circadian rhythm is an endogenous rhythm. Basically, everything in nature has a biological rhythm. Everything has a time to sleep, a time to grow, a time to protect. The circadian rhythm works on a 24.2-hour basis. The Earth rotates on 24 hours, so something has to give here. The circadian rhythm has to be realigned twice throughout a 24-hour period with signals from the environment, whether it's this environment or this environment, in order to be recalibrated twice during a particular time of the day. Epigenetics. Epigenetics is the study of change. It's relatively new. It's come out basically in the way that we understand our DNA and our, our chromosomal linkage. And it is the study of change of how we can manipulate genes naturally without changing the sequence. And it's interesting. I like to use my bracelets as an example. Uh, chromatin of DNA, use my bracelets as the nucleotides, the DN, you know, the ATCs and Gs. Well, 51% of every one of our genes are determined to be regulatory genes. And they have a protein sleeve, it's a histone sleeve that's over top. And on top of this sleeve sits a marker. It's an epi above the gene marker. And the job of this epigenetic marker is to nothing except look out for signals. Internal signals and environmental signals. And the signals it looks for most are interesting. The environmental cues that we in the design community, we consider them design elements. Light is the primary signal that the genes are looking for. 32,000 plus genes we have and 51% of them are looking for light. Temperature, extremely important. Temperature is critical. And so when we're doing the commissioning, when we're doing the commissioning of our projects, please don't undervalue the value of a mechanical engineer in a, in a project. So don't exclude he or she from that charrette or from the integrative design process and that table because in the future, coordinating and commissioning lighting controls with temperature controls is going to be key and critical because it's the combination of the two that determine the viability of the circadian system. And feeding times. Not what you eat, but the time of day that you eat. And this is very important for lighting designers. 
because simply by highlighting photographs or images of food, science has now demonstrated that we can start the process of releasing ghrelin and leptin, which are the two hormones that determine satiation or hunger. And so by purposely highlighting photographs and art within a space, we can hit every one of those. We can make a temperature difference simply by the color of the, of the spaces that we use and the lighting. It changes more than just visual appeal. A recent study showed that one of the major genes by the name of clock, I thought it was so appropriate, really is impacted simply by the depression that so many of our individuals around the world are, are now experiencing. The clock gene itself is shifting and disrupting the entire circadian system, particularly in six regions of the brain, leaving only two marginally operational. And it's interesting, because what we can do with light, intent-driven light, has the ability, it hasn't been shown yet, but in theory, it has the ability to make a difference and to reactivate possibly those six regions. And you know how it's doing it? It's because we're using nature's prescription. Nature prescribes light. It prescribes temperature. So as the wave of light strikes us, the Earth, and everything else, the body is paying attention to the spectral power distribution of that light. And it's looking specifically in a dosing protocol. A number of medical researchers are now even considering and using the term as light as a drug because it has a biological shift, a change. It actually changes and causes a genetic shift. Now, I'm not talking about changing the sequence of the epigenetic. It turns the genes on or off. So if the gene sleeve, the epigenetic sleeve, gets the right signal at the right time of day because nature or architects and designers have provided the right light at the right time of day. The sleeve says, OK, pulls it up, and the genes express or they stay silent. If the sleeve is pulled down and the right lighting conditions are not present, guess what? Nothing happens. And we're now seeing that very specifically with obesity particularly center line momentum derived obesity. And we're looking specifically at the dosing protocol of the way nature prescribes light. So when we're looking at circadian adaptive lighting or dynamic lighting that is going to be powerful enough to drive and impact a person's disease chances or healing rates, we're looking at the timing of that light, the intensity of the light, the duration, the location, and the direction of the light, the wavelength itself, the spectral power distribution. Specifying a light source just with a Kelvin temperature or a high RA, you know, and specifically a high R, uh, R9, is no longer going to get it when we're looking at trying to drive and expect light to do something for the human animal. Darkness is the opposite of light, and we need darkness. We need darkness for a number of processes, primarily hormonal expression. It's key and critical. And something called bistability. Everyone's always talking about how, yes, blue rich white light is great. Well, it is during a certain time period of the day. The day. Unless you're going to be emulating circadian systems and you're trying to work with a special population, such as night shift workers or some of the emergency workers that, that work odd hours. But blue rich white light source from an electric source is key and critical if we're not getting a high enough circadian light inside the space in order to be able to suppress a key hormone so that that same hormone can express or turn on 12 to 16 hours later. We have something called bistability in our cones, in our eyes, and in the way that our genes work. We have to have one in order to balance out the other. If we have a high preponderance of blue-rich white light during the day, we have to have a higher level of red long wavelength light for a number of reasons. 
for the, for the uh, isomerization process in, in the cones of the eyes, and also to regenerate the newly, I don't know why everyone keeps calling it newly diagnosed, or newly uh, you know, specified IPRG cells in the biological clock, but melanopsin, the chemical that's involved in the non-visual light-sensing cells in the eye, needs a balance of red, long wavelength light in order to regenerate. You can't just have a room filled with blue-rich white light source and expect an optimized non-visual um, response. So here's a graphic, very simple graphic, how this all works. This is supposed to represent the Earth on a 24-hour basis changing. And as the Earth changes, something is paying attention, and it's the genes, specifically two genes, BMOL1 and CLOCK. And these genes are unique because BMOL is involved in just about every opportunity that we have to be human. But it has to be able to degrade in some areas, and in other areas, it has to be able to be expressed, particularly when we're looking at blood cell formation. So as these genes are turning on and off in response to the different wavelengths of light and dark throughout the day, the circadian system is paying attention. That, in turn, sets the motion and the regularity of the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm determines the hormonal release, by and large, mostly at night, and we're talking of hormones, ghrelin, leptin, melatonin. And it also determines neurotransmitters, by and large, by day those transmitters that are responsible for motion, peristaltic motion, serotonin, mood, serotonin, how attention span, what your attention span is likely to be throughout the day with dopamine and estradiol. That then sets in turn another set of genetic response that turns into the reciprocitous action of the sleep-wake cycle, growing and waking. Anabolic, catabolic. We have a feedback loop from the circadian system. And guess what? Electric light does the exact same thing. The exact same thing. This is a gene, PR period two, in breast cancer. This area in here, work from Steve Hill and Tulane, shows that light at night will disrupt MT1 and 2, which is melatonin, and the major genes that act as a protectorant from starting this cell to develop and progress. This cell is breast cancer cell. And I've held petri dishes of this cell in my hand, a collection of this cells, and I took it, placed it in the light, and then I placed it under a dark table, and it moves. It's responsive to the light. Interesting thing is, this just recently came out, very recent, ovarian cancer is now linked to light at night, particularly among women working the night shift. And it's women that are in their late 40s and early 50s who only work 2.7 to 3.5 years. Any longer than that, they seem to pass the hurdle. But it's that initial opportunity of working that really dysregulates their system. So in the future, knowledge to practice, what's going to happen is that when we are hired to design a building, we're going to have to understand who are the people, who are the bodies and brains in this building, and what chronotypes do they have? The chronotypes being, do they have a preference and a genetic predisposition for staying up late at night or getting up early in the morning? And you know, it's not long down the pike before we're going to be held accountable the American Medical Association this past June, last June, almost a year now, came out with uh, a policy change speaking about how we need to control blue-rich white light at night, particularly in, in the area of children. I know the DIN in Germany is working on some design guidelines. They came out April 4th. The EU also has some information on vertical lighting that was a direct result of understanding how light impacts circadian systems. So it's really critical that we understand what this body and brain want, what they need, rather, I should say, 
before we start asking, well, what aesthetic do we need here, or, or what ambience do we need there? I mean, they're all very critically important. Please don't get me wrong. But if we want to make an impact on the body and brain, and we want to make an impact on the bottom line, and really promote daylighting, we need to understand what daylighting does to the body and brain first and foremost. And it, I'm going to close with this gene, KLF14. It's a master regulatory gene. It's now found in diabetes, all metabolic syndrome, uh, a number of other conditions. And it encodes melatonin. Absolutely critical for melatonin, which is the major DNA protectant and tumor suppressant of the body. It's not just the pill you pop to take before you sleep. There's so much more, and I am so far in, in terms of not being over my time, and I wish I had more time to share with you. But the interesting thing that came in yesterday, and I'll share this with you, is that a research facility, a combination of research facilities, just recently discovered um, a human connection to science research that had been in the animal kingdom since 1987. That for the first time, they're now recognizing that light will penetrate through hair, skin, omentum, placenta, and fetal surface. And very key and critical for visual development in the last few days of the first trimester. And the researchers are, are hypothesizing that in the future, we're going to be having light dosing protocols for pregnant women. So if we're just thinking daylighting is about energy efficiency, come on, think about it as human energy efficiency. Thank you.